Um, and as far as incomplete grades go, if you had given incompletes for spring semester, the last day to make up that um, incomplete grade is November 2nd. And then the faculty grade submission deadline is December 22nd at um, 12 p.m. So I did want to bring your attention to this September 15th financial aid freeze um, date. What that basically means is that if any student for some reason is added to a course um, anytime after September 15th, those course credits would not be able to be used to um, to get fi federal financial aid because we freeze the student's course schedule on September 15th. So we do um, often communicate this to students and um, ensure that they know that if, the, if they're not in a course before September 15th, then they won't be eligible for aid for that course. So we have a late registration um, period, and this is the first week of school um, from August 24th to September 15th. First, um, right now, Flora's gonna jump in because there's a new process for adding dropping courses in this new COVID time. So I'm gonna pass this over to Flora. So uh, due to COVID and the fact that we um, have limited uh, walk-in service, uh, we've had to implement a virtual registration process to allow students, instead of um, submitting the normal registration change form in hard copy form, we're accepting emails that's, as long as it's sent from their Hawaii EDU email account. So, um, and sent to our UHMC REC email. Um, normally, we we have two different email addresses, one for admissions and records, and we've created this new records email to kind of split up some of the uh, documents coming into our office um, because our A and R email gets bombarded from time to time, and we were missing. Uh, records uh, getting buried. So this kind of streamlined anything to do with registration and records. <laughs> so um, the virtual registration process would be if you are approached by a student that wants to register late, and I'm sure we, we are still um, receiving requests as of today. Um, they would send you the email request to register for the course. You would provide the necessary overrides. Uh, some may be that your courses are closed, so you need to do capacity override, or if the student needs a prereq override, you would go into your MyUH services portal, insert that override code, and forward the email to our UHMC REC uh, email address, and we would process the ad. So um, there was a urgency to get this done for the financial aid uh, deadline of September 15th, but since it's passed, then uh, no urgency uh, now. Um, I, I wanted to speak to the academic calendar, um, Kahia. Uh, I know we only address the, the dates for semester length courses, but uh, oftentimes, I receive uh, inquiries from instructors on where to find the information on drop and withdrawal um, dates and deadlines for non-semester length. So if I, I, we don't have it here, but um, if you're all familiar with how students find um, the class availability through our main web page, students would just go to that class availability, click on the subject and the course CRN and the dates, uh, withdrawal dates and refund deadlines are listed at the top. Uh, so 
I can send out additional information if um, you're not familiar with um, our class availability uh, web page. Okay, Kaya, I can. Um... So grade rosters. So it's very important that you reconcile your UH, my UH grade rosters, that's the official grade roster of record um, with your Laulima. Um, oftentimes, instructors will add students to the Laulima and they're not officially registered in the course. So very important that you go back and check the my UH services. If you have any discrepancies between the two, please notify me as soon as possible um, so that we can fix any issues prior, before the end of the term when grades um, are due. Um, because we, we'll, we want to minimize having to um, register students who's been sitting in courses unofficially. Um, I think that's all for the rosters. So um, importance of no-show reporting. So you all should have received uh, the no-show survey. Um, it's sent out by um, our student success uh, starfish. Uh, I know that, um, well, I'll address questions on the no-show, but there's some confusion as to when you should report the student as no-show, uh, even more so now that we've moved classes to online delivery. Um, so, uh, well, for one, if we don't report the student and they don't show up, and at the end of the term, uh, you'll have to assign a an F grade so that will impact the student's academic record, which then would affect their GPA and negatively impact their financial aid ability. Uh, it uh, also, if they, because we, we don't purge anymore, students who normally would um, pay if they just not show up, they don't pay. Now they have a financial ob and they also have potentially uh, academic record of, of F. So they'll be less likely to return to us if they have you know, those two issues. So early um, identification of these types of students is very important for financial aid because there is a difference. If you do report students um, as no-show, they're all of their financial aid is returned as opposed to if they showed up for one course instruction, it's prorated. I don't know, maybe um, Kahia can speak more to uh, no show and financial aid. Um, no, I, th I think you pretty much covered it. The, the sooner we can identify a student as a no show, um, the sooner we can con make contact with the student before it's so far ahead, I mean, um, or late in the term before we figure out that the student is a no-show because then it's harder to contact them for the return of funds. But I did want to answer um, Sandy's question. So the financial, there's really no financial aid application deadline. A student can apply starting October 1st before the academic year starts that they want to attend college all the way through after the term ends. Um, so that's like July 31st. So you're talking like 18 months of an application ban for FAFSA. So there's no um, deadline per se. We do have a priority um, date that we ask students to apply to our college for the following academic year and that's usually March 1st but all that means is it guarantees that if you do a FAFSA before March 1st that we will have you awarded before the the term starts in the fall 
Um, but a student can apply as late as July and still have their award before school starts. It just really is dependent on whether or not their application needs to be verified after we receive it. So I don't know if that fully answers your question, Sandy. Um, well, so she said that she wants to take classes this coming spring mm -hmm. and she's hoping that she'll get approved for financial aid. Well, is, there, is that a possibility that she can get financial aid for the spring? Uh, yes. Okay. If she, did she apply yet? I would I'm, say ass I'm assuming so. I, she just emailed me yesterday I because I was emailing with her over the summer and she said, yeah, I wanted to take, well, actually in this last spring and she was going to take classes and I was reviewing everything and I noticed that she wasn't uh, taking any classes. So I had emailed her and she said, and then she replied yesterday saying um, she wasn't able to get financial aid. So that's why she's not taking classes this fall, but she's hoping to get approved for financial aid in the spring so she can take classes in the spring. Okay, would you mind sending me her information? Sure. Um, and then we'll follow up with her. Okay, the other thing is, I know there was like COVID money for students. I mean, the care you know? funds, yes. So uh, depending on their situation, she might be able to get qualify. So technically those uh, CARES funds need to be spent by December 31st, 2020. So, cause she oh. won't be a student till spring. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll, okay. I'll send you, I'll forward you her um, email address for, for this. And, and that's the information we have right now. Right. So uh, yeah, know, if the school gets more money or the feds extend the spend deadline out till 2021, then that might change. But for okay. right now, yeah. Okay. Qualify. Okay, thanks. So, so Sandy, um, on that note with that student, since she stopped out and she's not attending, she would need to do an acceptance rollover to spring semester to keep her application active. Okay. She's not taking classes. Okay, all right. I'll let her know. Sorry, uh, did you want to talk about student appeals? So um, from time to time, we'll have students who for some unforeseen uh, circumstance, uh, cir uh, circumstances beyond their control need to drop uh, and withdraw. Um, we do have an appeals process. Uh, missing a drop deadline is not an appeal appealable reason but it it needs to be something that is beyond the student's control so medical is usually one that we would um you know consider and get approval so we do have a process online i can forward you the the link um but just as another option if you do run into a situation with a student where they disclosed that they had some kind of an issue that prevented them from continuing uh, in school, then you can reach out to me and I'll send you the information on student appeal. So special note, um, Reporting of no-shows, uh, I will sometimes receive requests from instructors. Um, student shows up for one or two classes and disappears uh, for the rest of the, maybe halfway uh, through the term, and they will ask me to drop the student. Um, this, um, the only time faculty can request to drop students is during the no-show period, uh, all other times the student is responsible to drop courses. So this is uh, the My Success Progress Survey schedule. Uh, we didn't put in the dates because for our campus, we are one of the few campuses that report no show for every part of term. So it differs uh, depending on the start. So uh, we've 
completed the part of term one, which is the 16 weeks. Um, Kelly, you will open up the survey. So if you do have uh, courses uh, that you teach that is non-semester length, it'll only be open for two days and it's usually the first and second day of the uh, part of term date period. Uh, so that's the no-show survey part. There is a lag in the time that you report the no-show from when I actually performed the drop um, of courses. So because it's a manual process, um, communication is key. So if you mark someone as no-show and they show up to your next course, um, please let me know um, because I'll, I'll need to clear the flag because if not, I will drop them uh, from the course unless I hear from you. So um, if you can just please make sure you communicate. Um, there's an early alert survey uh, that um, also I think it's coming out pretty soon. It's usually in the fifth week uh to report you know how the progress uh, of students and maybe i don't know shane you might want to speak i know i'm putting you on a spot but since you're counseling i know counselors reach out and um, monitor uh, these surveys uh, to make sure students stay on track or provide additional support services for students who are, who may be struggling and need a little more attention uh, then the uh, last, yeah, on a chain. No, I was going to say that's what they're earlier the surveys for, which um, will be happening, I believe, this week, from what I understand. Thank you, Shane. And then there, the last survey would be to consider withdrawing survey. This comes out um, kind of closer to before the November 2nd withdrawal deadline. Um, and this is usually if the student, you will see that they're not going to make it, you would, you know, send them a notice to consider withdrawing. Anyone have any questions on no-show? I do. Um, okay. What if you have a student that adds after the drop deadline and doesn't do anything in class and not able to drop them? Uh, they didn't complete anything? No. Okay, so I would um, report them as a no-show. Even after the no-show deadline? Because I have a student that added and I've been in contact, I've been trying to contact her and tell her to start doing something, but she hasn't uh, responded at all. Uh, it and it was how far into the semester was it after the first of September? Uh, it was on the first, I think she added. I would report her as a no show. Okay. Well, I mean, can I still as long do as that? You, you still can do that. Just send me an email and okay. just say that the student registered late on the first and okay. has not participated at all in any. Uh, class activity okay. and has not, you know, made contact. Yeah, and I, and I also, yeah, I even saw, I can run a report in in Lao Lima and doesn't show her ever logging into Lao Lima. Okay, yeah, you can send me a message. Okay. All right, thanks. Anyone else have any questions before we move on? Okay, go ahead. So grades, um, fall semester is usually a very crunch time for us because of the Christmas holiday. So we are working with a really short window of time uh, when it comes time for grade submission at the end of the term. So our term ends on December 18th. So grades are usually due the Tuesday of the following week um, by 12 noon. 
So um, importance of submitting grades on time would be um, it impacts federal financial aid. Um, Kahia folks, uh, they have a 30 day window to report, uh, you know, having to return funds. So this is where the no show also comes, comes into play because if you don't mark them as a no show in the beginning, when it's time to submit your grades and you need to submit a last date of attendance if you're assigning a non-passing grade. And this is where sometimes we find out that, oh, this person should have been reported as a no-show. So now it's impacting uh, Kahea and her team and uh, calcul recalculating their uh, Title IV funding. So that's why it's very important uh, that we you know, participate in no-show uh, and submit grades on time. Um, it also impacts student transcripts. So we will have students who may be transferring to other institutions and will need their grades submitted to, uh, you know, the, their new campus. But if our grades are delayed, then it'll, it'll delay their acceptance. So um, also it impacts graduation as well. So if they need that grade, to apply for graduation uh, that also, I don't have it here, but uh, it does impact graduation. Um, it also impacts registration for subsequent semesters. So on uh, after at the end of every semester, after I do the official grade roll, I get sent a, a failed prereq report. So if they, even with uh, I grade assignments, it'll, put them on this list that they won't, don't have the necessary prerequisites to move on to the next course. So, um, Also, I know some uh, instructors choose to use Laulima to transfer their grades into MyUH. If you choose to do so, please go into MyUH services portal to make sure that your grades uh, were submitted um, correctly, you, you are more than welcome to call me and I can verify and confirm once you submit. Um, as I mentioned, non-passing grades, you need to notate the last date of attendance. And for this also, uh, Kahea also follows up with an additional email from financial aid um, requesting how you came up with that last date of attendance and what kind of activity did the student uh, perform in in the class for you to how you came up with that date. Uh, if you need to do any change of grade uh, forms, uh, the form needs to be signed by by you. Uh, we have paper forms, uh, although we are not open for walk in we do um, welcome if instructors prefer to submit the paper form. I believe the department secretary still has forms um, at their desk or you can pick up in our office. Uh, I do have an electronic grade change form that I developed. Uh, I don't send it out um, because I do need to make contact with instructors and I'll, I'll send you instructions. So if you do need to make a grade change requests, um, you can reach out to me and I'll send you the instructions. It's a little complicated now because um, of privacy. You, we need to utilize the file drop service. Um, it can't be sent through email. So, um, and I, I'm not, okay. you know, not everyone has uh, access to print and sign hard signature, so. Did I have a question? No? Oh, anybody have any questions on grade change form? I have a grade? question that I'm not sure if you covered this, maybe I missed it, uh, for incomplete grades. Have you gone over that or are you gonna go over that? Um, so I think have... it's on the le the next slide is, okay. I think, I believe we, we will cover incomplete. Oh yeah, there it is. <laughs> okay, so um, incomplete grades. Uh, if you wanna, if you believe the student is progressing enough, um, 
and unable to finish the term, uh, we kind of, if you don't need to give an incomplete, it, 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 if the student has financial aid, then it's, it's kind of, um, it's harder for financial aid to uh, move on, right, Kahia? Uh, yes, so, um, so what happens is uh, financial aid is required to count credits that are completed and credits that aren't completed compared to credits that were attempted. So sometimes when students end up with incomplete grades that are passing, like IA, IB, IC, ID, we actually can't count those credits because they're incomplete still. So as long as they're incomplete, they're not counted as completed. So it's really for the student's benefit since they actually have earned those credits to just get the grade. Um, but if the student is trying to earn a higher grade, there's, it's the change grade is always an option, right, Flora? So yes. um, giving them maybe a C, even though they're working towards an A, I would suggest giving the student the C. And then if they do complete the work that they need to do for you, and you're you plan on giving them a higher grade than a C, then you would do the grade change form, which would have to be done um, when you give an incomplete grade and are going to change that IC to a to a different grade anyway. Yeah. So, sure um, that's your question. Well, my question was just about the deadline. So I see the deadline on there is November 2nd for um, spring semester. Oh, okay. Incomplete. Anyone else have any questions on incomplete uh, grades? Also, um, along the lines of incomplete grades, so the deadline is November 2nd. So if you did assign a incomplete grade, you would need to submit your change of grade form to me prior to the November 2nd deadline so that I can make the change before I perform the incomplete grade uh, conversion. Uh, I usually do it the following day. So um, yeah, if you can just get that change of grade in. So I, I believe some tips on uh, including verbiage on your syllabi is to include um, drop and withdrawal deadlines for specific um, parts of term. Because like we said, the academic calendar that is posted is targets mainly the part of term one, which is the 16 week uh, courses. So it's especially important if your course is not the full 16 weeks that you do post these drop and withdrawal deadlines because oftentimes students will say, oh, but I looked at the academic calendar and it said I have until this date. So to prevent um, confusion, then we ask and we recommend that you add the, this verbiage to your syllabi or instructional sheet uh, to your students. And um, Kahea is so asking I, um, about, yeah. Yeah, so I have, um, and I sent this out before, and I know there's um, something that comes out from the dean's office with everything that's like required to be in your, um, in your syllabi, along with messages from other campus offices. So these, this is one of the things that financial aid asks. Um, <clears throat> for instructors, um, if you would be willing to include a message like this in your syllabus, and it, it just is basically a message to your students that before they withdraw from your class, that they contact the financial aid office um, if they're financial aid students, just so we can talk about the impact um, the decision that they're making to withdraw is going to have on their financial aid. 
Um, we just want them to know all of the, what will happen or could happen before they make that final decision. We sometimes have students who have dropped, realized there's a financial impact that's going to negatively affect them. And then they contact the, then they change their mind and they contact the teacher and they want back into the class. Um, and it's not as easy as just undoing what they've already done. It requires them to go through a process with the admissions office um, to get back into a class and all of these things come into play. So that's why we just ask if possible, um, if this short message can be added to your syllabus, um, which it may already be there um, as part of, like I said, that set of uh, requested items that get sent out from your deans, I think at the beginning of the term. Okay, so what is FREPA? Um, this is really short. Uh, there's going to be an upcoming FREPA training. Yeah. Uh, there's changes that um, will be coming out, I think, um, from the system office sometime in the next month or two. Um, I haven't gone to my training yet. There's a whole lot on online and distance um, FERPA requirements, but for those not familiar, it's uh, the Family Rights and Privacy Act, um, which affords students certain rights and we need to protect their uh, records and privacy. Um, before we can release uh, any educational record, we do need consent from the student. Um, just some basics. So public information would be information that would be considered directory. Um, I know you'll probably be seeing some links to FERPA training by the federal government. Um, all, it's just general guidelines, but our, at the University of Hawaii, we have a little more conservative um, idea of directory. So there is certain um, differences uh, that may, you know, come out. Uh, one is eligible student. A student is upon acceptance at some institutions and that may just be as soon as their application gets accepted. But here at UH, it's once they register for a course is when FERPA kicks in. So throughout the admissions process, we can answer questions from parents or, you know, significant others uh, without consent from the student. Um, so uh, I'm going to be sending out a, a PowerPoint and a little um, general seven page form on FERPA basics, but it like FERPA training, it probably takes up anywhere from two to four hours. So I, I just, um, if anybody had any burning questions on FERPA, um, the rule is if you, we may give out information, but you don't have to, you're not required. So if you have any questions, you can give me a call and um, I can, you know, instruct you on how to respond or so basically please use the Hawaii EDU email to correspond with students and uh, I know a lot of people use their mobile devices and sometimes the primary account that students send their info is the, like their Gmail so if you do receive correspondence from students please instruct them to use their Hawaii EDU whenever they're discussing their education record because um, authentication is the only way we will know uh, to make sure that you, you are corresponding with the student. Um, and be careful leaving messages on uh, phone uh, recorders. If you're contacting them at home, don't leave detailed messages, just your name and number and to return. Don't even say it's because of your school record or, you know, class assignment. Um, you have to be careful on what kind of messaging you're leaving. 
because you're not uh, you're not sure who has access to playback messages. Um, I think that is all for FERPA, but I will be sending you additional information. So important websites is the academic calendar. It's on our main, our main webpage and located at the top, I think the third or fourth uh, link. Um, and we also have our FERPA privacy policies uh, on the web as well. I, I will be again sending you uh, three different handouts on FERPA. Um, RUH data governance, I think it's on the next slide, Unkahia. Uh, each data governance provides training um, to the campuses and they have their training materials and presentations. You do need to log in using your Hawaii EDU and I will be sending out that link as well with the FERPA information. So I'll uh, ask Joyce to send me a list of participants and I can um, forward you additional information. Does anyone have any questions? I think we went over our time. Thank you yeah. so Sorry, much, really Laura good. and um, Kahea. That was really interesting. And of course, everybody, they're always open to questions from you later. So please um, get to know them. They're really nice people. So um, um, please do that. Um, right now, Karen is here, Karen O'Neill. She's our brand new disabilities coordinator. So we're really happy to see her today and hear from her. So um, will you share your screen, Karen, for us? And, um, oh, you need to unmute too. Thank you. Uh, let's see. One. For some reason it is not sharing. So I'm clicking the share screen. Um, for some reason it's not going on. I don't know why. Let's see. Um, After you share, you, you're going to see all the different screens. So click on the correct screen and then say share. Yeah, it's not letting me go. Oh, here we now we're going in. Okay. Yay. Okay, let me pick the slide. I guess it's on a delay or something. Oh, perfect. We can see everything. Okay. Or we can see your Gmail, not your um, okay. PowerPoint. I got to get rid of the. Uh, the bar up there so I can get into it. Ah, uh, there we go. Um, so am I going to be able to see my notes if I put it in a different um, If you have two screens, yes, but if you don't, we'll be able to see it as well, but it's okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, so um, see, I'm trying to put it in a different well, let me see if I put it in the full screen mode, if it will show my notes too. Oh, how's that? Is that right on your end? Yeah, that's fine. I mean, we can see your notes and your side thing, but it's pretty big what we are able to see. So I think that's okay. Is it too big? <laughs> no. Okay. All right. So my name is Karen O'Neill. So I've been on board since July um, prior to me Shane, he's here. He was the Acton Disability Service Counselor. Um, so I took over and uh, reassembled the whole office, <laughs> uh, straightened everything out. So anyway, uh, so I've been working for three months now. So, um, and this little quote is just something, uh, just po positive psychology. You know, start each day with a positive thought and be grateful. I don't know who the author was, but just something positive. So um, today I'm gonna to be really brief. I'm just gonna kind of briefly go over some federal laws and policies that we have to follow here on campus as a uh, post-secondary university. 
Um, I'm gonna go over some of the testing classroom accommodations that we do provide. Um, also um, an example of an accommodation letter that I will send out to the instructors. And then some information for the faculty on um, different disabilities and kind of what we have on our website already. So it'll be uh, real easy for you guys to access. Um, so basically the federal laws and policies. So um, let me see if I can change the viewing because I can't see the screen. There we go. Um, so of course we have to comply with the Americans with Disability Act and the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Um, so we take each case on a, a case by case basis, um, reasonable accommodations. So we go through a little intake process. Um, we get documentation of their disability and then we kind of work hand in hand with the, with the student themselves to see what can best suit them for success. So real quick, like, um, and I'm sure you guys have all heard about it. Um, you know, so section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. So this is um, basically, let me move my tab bar again. Um, you know, it's a civil rights statute. So it's basically we have to comply if there's any federal, um, federal institution, you know, that has programs or activities, we have to make sure that they are accessible to persons with disabilities. So basically no discrimination. So right here in the last paragraph, the law requires that the post-secondary schools prepare and make appropriate accommodations and reasonable modifications to their procedures and practices. And that's not to say we're gonna change any the outcome of uh, what you're teaching. So we don't do that. We just kind of uh, tweak a little bit on how they can learn So that's the 504. Then the next one is the Americans with Disability Act of 1990. So this came out basically to uh, really enforce the 504. So it backs up. So not only with federal institutions that receive uh, federal funds, but this is with or without federal funds. Institutions cannot discriminate. So it's kind of just like a backup uh, disability uh, law. Uh, and another thing that we have to comply with is, oh, this is just the, uh, this is the Americans with Disability Act amendment. So this just basically describes uh, the definition of a disability. It just clarifies everything a little bit deeper. And those are stuff that you guys can get into. Um, so it's a physical or mental impairment um, that substantially limits one or more major activities with the uh, individual. So, and it could be, uh, a record of having such an impairment or just being regarded as having an impairment. So, and this could include, they also clarified the major life activities. Um, and so that got into um, down here. So major life in general, it's like caring for oneself, performing manual tasks, um, seeing, hearing, eating, sleeping, walking, standing, lifting, bending, speaking, breathing, learning, reading, concentrating, thinking, communicating, and working. So any, any, of, any of those that are impaired could be regarded as uh, you know, an impairment and having a disability. And of course it includes the immune system, normal cell growth, um, could be your digestive system, your bowel, your bladder, neurological, brain, respiratory, circulatory, uh, endocrine, and reproductive functions. So it's pretty broad, yeah. Okay, and so this is one that's very important um, for now in the times of COVID where everyone is doing their online Zoom in. So this is section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act. So they did a final ruling, and this is just recently, three years ago, January, 2017. Um, and it is to include, you know, all electronic and information technology um, all software applications, operating systems, web-based information, applications, computers, telecommunications products, video and multimedia and self-contained closed products. So basically what this means for you faculty is that if you have a student with a, um, that is hearing impaired, then you would have to provide you know, closed captioning if that's what they're requesting, if that's an accommodation. 
um, and or if they don't have, you know, a sign language interpreter in there in the classroom with them. So um, that's a big one. So I, right here, it's actually a live link, I believe. Um, and you guys can get into that deep more deeply if you want to, but we also have good tech people on the campus that can help you out with all that. Say like you want to show a video in one of your Zoom classes um, and you do, you do know that you have a student with a disability that's here and impaired. So you would want to provide closed captioning to that video prior to showing that to the rest of the class so everyone can see it. So um, I know uh, Deanna Reese can help you. Um, who's the other one? Laureen. Um, don't know her last name. You guys can help me out there. Yeah, Laureen um, Kodani is yeah. the one generally. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yeah. So both media and IT, they can all really, really assist you with anything that you may need, you know, if you realize you have a student in your class that may need that, okay? Uh, so this, that link kind of gets, you can get into a lot more things if you want to really read more, more on it. Um, all the standards and the guidelines that, you know, may help you to understand it better. Okay. Oh, how do I get out of here? All right. I got in it. Can't get out of it. <laughs> Um, well, let me just click that and see what that does. All right. Can't seem to get back to my video. Let's see. Um, well, I guess I could stop share and then go back because that's all I see on my screen, unfortunately. I may have to stop share and then go back into my last PowerPoints. So let me stop share and then try again. Sorry about that. Oh, now it's doing the same thing it did before. It won't let me into my screen. Let's try. Oh, there we go. Okay. Oh, let me see. That'll let me get back into it. Oh yeah, see I can't, there's nowhere on my screen that I can go backwards. Let me see if this will. Well, that wasn't a very good idea. <laughs> oh, I thought the live links would help. Oh, so for some reason, Joyce, I cannot get out of that screen. Um, uh, can you reopen your um, PowerPoint maybe? Okay, let's do that. Let's stop share. I might have to reopen everything. Okay. So let me shrink this down. Sorry, you guys. Oh, no, it's like stuck on that page. That is so strange. No. So yeah, there's no arrows to go back and it won't even let me go back in. Now that I open that live link. Okay. Huh. Um, if I give you back the share screen, would, would you be able to post it on your end, Joyce? Um, I don't have it up, but I will um, look for it right now. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, why don't you go back? you know, back in, um, on your PowerPoint and see if that'll come up? Yeah, I tried. I can't get back into it. I'm so weird. Um, Karen, what happens if you hit escape? Well, let's try. Okay, so I escaped the whole PowerPoint. And let me see if it'll let me pick it up again. No, it's like I have to go back in, close everything down, open it back up again. Because this screen here is that blank screen that won't let me go anywhere. Okay, um, I think I'll, I'll do it. I have the screen here. Okay, so um, here it is. Yeah, something about the, the active link or something. Did, yeah. yeah, so we were down probably like by slide eight. 
I wonder why it didn't go on. Can you see it? Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, so if you can go to maybe slide. Yeah, so go to slide nine. Oh no, slide eight, I'm sorry. Yeah, so this was the last, um, after the 508, the one, you know, with all the technology, the stuff that you guys faculty have to learn about. Um, then this is, this is the umbrella that covers all of the policies that uh, University of Hawaii non-discrimination and affirmative action that of course we have to comply by. And that entails, you know, everything from Civil Rights Act, you know, Equal Pay Act, Age Discrimination Act. Um, it you know, kind of goes on and on. You guys get the gist though. So it covers everything, yeah. Which the university has to comply by. So, okay. So those were the federal laws. So, um, so here at the university, we, we provide, these are our, our most common accommodations. So within the classroom, we have, um, occasionally we'll hire note takers or the students will use note taker apps. Nowadays, note taker, note taker apps are more common than note takers um, because everything is online. So we have readers or reader apps. We also have scribes, people that will help write and scribe apps. apps. Um, we have, of course, sign language interpreters, um, closed captioning. Um, students can use you know, tape recorders if they need. Um, alternative textbooks, that's pretty common nowadays with e-texts, you know. Um, um, sometimes we provide extra tutoring if they need that extra time at the TLC. And um, sometimes some other things which may be like extra time on their classroom assignments or some students like to sit close to uh, the instructor. Uh, of course, now with on Zoom, it's a little different, but um, so sometimes there's some, you know, different different instructions there. So those for those are classroom accommodations. So then we have uh, testing accommodations that we provide also. So um, we can give extra time on tests. Our most common one is time and a half. So if the test is an hour long, we will give like uh, you, the instructor can give an hour and a half. Um, a lot of times the students will go to the TLC um, because they like that distraction reduced environment where the TLC will provide a, um, a private room for them to go into to take the test. So it's nice and quiet so they don't get distracted. Um, so we can also provide, um, you know, readers there, scribes, oral, braille, enlarged print dependent on their um, circumstances. And sometimes we have some other accommodations um, dependent on the situation. Here's an example of the accommodation letter that I will normally mail out to you guys. I'll email it to you. Um, so it'll have um, the student's name on there. And then underneath all these accommodations, test and accommodations and classroom accommodations, I'll put an X next to the one that we are requesting. And with the other, I'll try to be as specific as I can be as to what that other specific thing may be. And of course, um, all this is confidential, so we want you to keep that confidential. Shred it after the student leaves the class. Um, and if, of course, if you have any questions or anything, please give me a call and I can help you kind of you know, work through that um, if you don't understand what exactly it is that you need to provide. I have a question that came from somebody else. Okay. And he was telling me yesterday that he said that when he, um, receives this letter, he sort of doesn't exactly know what to expect. And um, after he gets the letter, I guess the procedure is, is that you have to wait for the student to contact you or, or, or reveal that they have this letter. Is that true? Well, you know, it's a lot of the students are shy, especially their first year students. So I would recommend the faculty reach out to the student. Oh, um, okay. I'll convey yeah. that. And, and one of the things is that he wanted more information just to be prepared. And, you know, is it a really mild thing that they just need maybe more time or is it more severe where he has to, you know, prepare more? And so is that possible to give them more information at this point on this letter or that's not the way? Well, that's where the communication with the student comes in. So the student and him can have a conversation 
and the student may say, well, you know, you know, this, this is my issue, you know, or they may not. Some students may not want to disclose what they have. They don't have to disclose their disability, of course, and, uh, but they can at least talk it through to see where the teacher can understand a little more about what the student is, you know, why is it, or, you know, what they actually need. Yeah. I think what he was asking for is just more information of before he speaks to the student uh, is what he was asking. Yeah. And that's where all that information on the faculty on the next slide comes in. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. You had that there. Okay. Call me. Um, I'm available. So oh. they can always call me and I can help them understand exactly what it is that they, that student may need, you know, that they don't understand. But um, so, so more information for the faculty. And this is really, really helpful. They had the University had already put together quite a, a really extensive website. So the UHMC Disability Services website is where you'll go. Just Google that and you will come up to this link. I'm afraid to go on it right now. <laughs> I'll go on it last. Um, but uh, and it kind of inside there, um, it'll go in and it'll kind of give you um, uh, tips for success for different disabilities. So like if the student has a learning disability or you know, a hearing disability, or, uh, so it'll kind of go into those different um, disabilities and give you some tips on what you could do to set up the student to be more successful. Um, of course, contact me if you have any concerns or questions, you know, I'm here to help you uh, through all that. Um, uh, just one thing to be aware of that some students you know, if they get accommodations, they, they can do whatever they want. Um, we've had students that um, just because they have extra time, they think someone else can do their work. I mean, you know, you know if, if it's not stated on the letter, you do not, you're not obligated to provide it. So if I, you know, give you that letter and you check it off and, you know, on it, the scribe is not checked off, but you're noticing that it looks like someone else is doing their work for them, then bring it up to me because that is an issue. Because uh, that's something that we didn't approve of. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's just something to be aware of. Um, it's rare, but it does happen. Uh, oh, and another thing I just wanted to mention that the website that's up now has got quite a few different names on it. So it, it's got of course, Shane's name on it still. Um, some of the forms go way back to Lisa Deneen, who was working back 10 years ago. So it's really not updated. Uh, the best way if a student does need accommodations is to contact me or UHMCDS at hawaii.edu and I'll provide the forms that are updated um, that they can fill out. So it's like an intake packet, just kind of get all the information, get, um, information from the doctor on what their diagnosis is. And then to, I can um, decipher all that information and um, work together with the student to decide what accommodations they need. So Karen, that, I have a question. Yeah. So um, if we're, so we are obligated, so whatever is on that form, we are obligated to offer that to the student, right? Yes. What if the student says, oh no, I'm okay. I don't need extra time on that project. I'm all good and then they don't get a good grade on the project. And then they're like, well, that's because I didn't get, have enough time. So how do we cover ourselves in a situation like that? I guess is my question. Always give them the extra time. And if they don't use it, then that's up to them. Like say you give them an hour and a half for that hour test and they only want to spend 25 minutes on it and they're done, then that's their choice. That, you know, that basically is there to cover them. So if their disability is acting up, um, you know, it, if they're having a bad, a bad day that day, um, you know, like say for instance, some people with anxiety, they get test anxiety. So it gets really flared up and then they can't even think straight, you know, so that extra time is there for them to cover them. Um, not all students will use all that time. Like I said, it's mostly there to cover them in case their disability is really, if they're having a bad day. So even if they deny it and say, no, I don't need it. You still, this is what that's provided for them if it's on that letter, but if okay. they don't, if they don't want to use it, that's their choice. They they do not have to use it. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. 
Um, so lastly, I'm gonna see if this live link will go in. Oh, oh I guess I'll show you my last slide first because this kind of pertains to, um, let's go to the last slide first, then I'll go over to that live link just in case I get stuck. Um, so this was kind of something someone had said to me a long time ago. I don't know who the author is, but it kind of pertains to what we're doing here with the accommodations. So, you know, if your plan isn't working, change your plan, but not your goal. So pretty much it covers, you know, it, you're teaching that class and your goal is to get through all of these um, standards that you have to get through to teach that class. You don't have to, you don't change that for this student that has disabilities. You kind of just change the plan up a little bit for the student. Okay, and now we'll go back and I will click on, yeah, there we go. So this website um, that they set up, uh, you might have to scroll for me to help me a little bit, but uh, so, yeah, so it's got the top information for faculty. So you can kind of go down at the beginning here, keep, keep scrolling. Those are all the, uh, so right here, we've got the hearing disabilities, learning disabilities, mobility disabilities. And if you went into any one of those, it'll kind of give you um, those skills for success. So uh, say for instance, learning disabilities, if you wanna click on that, that's pretty extensive. And we have a lot of students um, here on campus with learning disabilities. Um, so it brings you down to kind of explains what the learning disability is you know, how to structure the class for success. And then down below, you know, this kind of lets you know their impairments. You know, they, they have the inability to, uh, to organize and budget time. They have difficulty taking notes and outlining material, uh, difficulty following directions, you know. So all these things with writing skills and language. And so it kind of gives you these little tips on what you can recognize within the student. And then you can go back up to the top and it'll show you those skills um, that may help you, like right here, how to structure the students. Uh, oh, those, that's here, and so the other one is down below, I'm sorry, the learning disabilities. So it'll go down and then, so then you've got these, you know, at least these little tools right here. Uh, so, you know, provide a detailed course syllabus, clearly spell out the expect expectations, you know, before the course begins. Uh, Start each lecture with an outline of the material. This is really important for learning disabilities, especially. Uh, you know, briefly summarize, um, and that's another very important key point for the students. Uh, speak directly to the students. You know, uh, so this, yeah, you know, and like I said, this goes through all these little disabilities. So you know, hopefully that can help you guys. Um, does anyone have any questions? Or does Shane want to add anything? Um, yeah, thank you, Karen, it was a great job. Uh, just to add, going back to those accommodation letters, um, you know, Joyce, what you can tell that faculty member that accommodation letters is also kind of an avenue, an open door for that instructor to have that conversation with the student. You know, so um, what I encourage instructors to do is not do it though in front of the whole class, you know, uh, kind of pull it, pull the student aside and say, hey, you know, I got a letter from Karen, you know, just, you know, confirming that I got it, you know, do you have any questions or, you know, kind of, kind of a, uh, a way to kind of open a conversation. So it's not uncomfortable for the, the, the faculty as well as the student. So, um, one of the things is that, that uh -huh. he was um, mentioning was that he wanted more information before he talked to the student. You know, um, if it's something mild, that's fine. But then if it was something more severe, he wanted to sort of know what he could possibly offer or even prepare for it. Yeah. Uh, again, that's the student discretion. Yeah, how much yeah. they want to disclose. You know, everything is in strict confidentiality. If the instructor's um, still unsure, again, contact Karen, um, you know, and, and, and Karen will advise them appropriately. What we don't want instructors doing is kind of taking the initiative and trying to get more information because then you can get yourself into, you know, um, a touchy situation there. So you've got to be careful. 
Yeah, well, I also have another question. Um, I know that Lorene was sort of saying that whenever you have any kind of PowerPoint or whatever, it always has to be um, um, disability, not enabled, but something, you know, it has to be a certain kind of template. Is that true? Like, even if you don't have a student that um, has a disability? Compliant, it has to be compliant. Yeah, compliant, correct. Correct, and that, that should be standard practice um, not just because you have a student with a disability in your class. And that's something, unfortunately, um, Lorene has been struggling with, um, mm -hmm. you know, getting faculty to do is just uh, having anything that they put out there be accessible. We had a situation um, actually from another campus where um, it wasn't accessible and um, it just caused a lot of problems. So um, ideally, any, anything you put up should be accessible by law. Thank you. Just wanted to make that clear because I think a lot of people don't really realize that. Yeah, yeah. Especially with that new, you know, 508 federal law that came out. And it's probably, they're probably going to add another one on now that everyone's on virtual classroom. Uh, you know, it's probably going to get even more detailed. So I'll have to keep my ears and eyes out for that. Well, thank you, um, Karen and Shane. It was really interesting. Um, I just wanted to let everybody know this is our schedule. The next one will be on October the 8th. And we'll be talking mainly about the contract renewal document, which all of you need to start preparing for. And even lecturers also need to do a document as well. So um, it pertains to everyone here. And then um, we're gonna have a mid-semester check-in, um, learn about the library services, et cetera. And um, one of my favorite ones is when our chancellor comes and gets to know all of you and kind of um, you get a chance to talk to him and let him know what's going on and um, share ideas. And um, also Eris will come and maybe, you know, offer some personal counseling support if that's, you know, it's just a talk story kind of thing. And we also have a cohort's choice, meaning that anything, you know, during this time until then, if you are interested in something, they really want to learn more about it, um, you let me know and then we can, um, you know, um, have people come over and talk about it. And then the last one will be a kind of a fun one where we're talking about storytelling and, you know, um, indigenous um, culture. So um, that's for our, our fall semester, our spring semester. We really concentrate a lot on your document because it's going to be due. And um, <clears throat> so we do that. Um, but, you know, it's so great to see all of you here today. And I'll get this schedule out to you. I'm just trying to confirm most of the people for those dates. Um, and um, I'm hoping that this time and this day is a good time for you. Um, and for most people, it has been in the past, but if we need to change it, you know, I'm, I'm certainly open to that if there's a better time for you. And um, in the meantime, if you have any questions, you can call either myself or email Diane or, or Diane Meyer, who's on the call today, um, and we can help you. So we're hoping to see you on October 8th, which is a Thursday at 3.30. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see everyone. Thank you. Thank Hello, you everybody. Joyce. Have a good evening. Thank Take you. Care. Bye. Bye. -bye.